welcome to the National Sporting Library and Museum for today's uh, Coffee with the Curator. My name is Quadi Pfeiffer and I am the Deputy Director and the George L. Orstrom Jr. Curator. And I'd like to welcome Booth Malone as uh, one of our um, guest speakers for the program today. Uh, we just finished a great round of hot coffee uh, sponsored by Common Grounds here in Middleburg and some pastries from a shop down the street as well. Uh, it's raining a little bit, but uh, we have a lovely overhang here. So we were able to finish the programming for that portion. We're going to head into the museum now. Um, for those of you who are on the Zoom program, I am I, I do, am hooked into that. So if you have anything that you would like to add to the conversation, please feel free to speak. I will try to uh, make sure to cover questions and stop and ask those who are listening online for feedback as well. Uh, for those of you who've never been on this program before, we really encourage this to be a conversation. We're looking for feedback and to get new information from each other. And especially with this group, I think looking at the history of the American Academy of Equine Art, that everybody has a lot to offer. So I'm looking forward to the chat this morning. All right, we're going to head into the building. Please, for those of you online, bear with us for a few minutes. We're going to head in, get, rid of, um, get our coats hung up, and then regroup in the lobby. All right, thank you for those of you online for your patience as we got situated inside. Uh, we're really excited to explore 40 years of the American Academy of Equine Art this morning. I wanted to start off the conversation with a few questions. How many of you are artists? We've got one, two, three, four artists in the group, five. How many of you are members of the American Academy of Equine Art? So four of you, okay, perfect. How many of you are aware of the American Academy of Equine Art going back further than five years? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Okay, we've got a whole room of old timers. I love it. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. So for those of you who are online, um, same questions for you. Can you hear me? Please feel free to unmute for this portion. Yes. So how long have you been, are, are you an artist? No. No, no, no artists, okay. How yes. many of you have been, one, are you a member of the American Academy of Equine Art? No. No. Yes. no. Okay. <laughs> why? The question is why there will be membership brochures um, being sent um, after this. Uh, how long have you known about the American Academy of Equine Art? So 10 years? Okay, so we've got new folks on the on the program online. So we've got a mix. Great. Okay. Um, so 2020 hindsight is a little bit of a misnomer because technically it's the 41st year. Uh, we had planned on doing this exhibition in 2020. And due to the reasons why we're wearing masks today, we had to <laughs> reschedule. But in a lot of ways, it works because 2020 is behind us and here we are with this amazing exhibition. So um, I'd like to introduce again, Booth Malone, who uh, is really one of the uh, driving forces behind why this exhibition is here. Uh, uh, he give a little tease. <laughs> you can. <laughs> so uh, Booth was president of the American Academy of Equine Art when we started this conversation. And to his right is Yvonne Todd, who is the current president of the American Academy of Equine Art. <laughs> and I think we have some other board members here. Raise your hands. If you'd like to introduce yourself without the masses. <laughs> I'm Marilyn Sadler. I'm Sandler. Excellent. And I think Liz didn't make it yet. So there might be one more person coming. Okay. Uh, so we looked at the idea of um, exploring the founding of the org organization 40 years ago and setting the stage for sort of the need for the um, for AAEA and also all these great artists that were working in the topic at the time who were keen to, to create an, a group. So um, this particular painting that we're starting with does not actually start with the origin story. This was a featured painting to um, start the exhibition and it is by Booth Malone and it did win a director's award. We have five awards that are um, uh, were uh, awarded last night and we'll show them as we go through. Uh, and it's a great painting here. We've got Walking Up 2020. Uh, it's the collection of Mason Hardaway Lampton. 
And everything that we love about Booth Malone's artwork is really, I think, very prominently displayed in this um, composition with the beautiful use of color and such a great understanding of horses and human nature. And just that, that moment as we all recognize is very accessible. Uh, does anybody have any questions or thoughts about the painting before we move into the gallery? The background is, I know, right? So, and this orange here to bring the eye back in, it's just, it's a great composition. All right. Uh, I would just say about this this painting that uh, it's one of the reasons I've never had I hadn't gotten to Montpelier until a couple of years ago because this steeplechase in Georgia always ran on the same day. So that's where I've been for the last uh, 25 or 30 years. But this is the walk up to the beginning. Of, the race is not about to start. They're walking up the hill. And as an artist, you have to develop an eye. The technique and brushwork is all one thing, but you have to have this kind of hot like vision to look at that over there. And you have to instantly recognize that there's a possibility of that. And, and because they're moving creatures, they never stop still. And that's what cameras are for. And that's we, any artist, if, if Remington or Munnings or uh, Stubbs, any of them could have had a uh, high speed camera, they would have used it just like me. Uh -huh. And with this, this whole parade of horses coming up, uh, I, I thought it was beautiful. I want to capture the coloring and the light. And uh, I hardly care who the writer of your silks are. It's about the light and making the horses as beautiful as I can and capturing the atmosphere of that moment. Great. Sure. All right. It's, it's a, 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 if you stop action on the horse with high speed cameras that we've got now, lots of times the horses are caught in an awkward position. And one thing that solves that is using other horses to sort of complete the pattern. And between the three or four horses, you capture the grace. And no and no one horse looks awkward doing it that way. So it's a, a bit of a bit of a trick, I suppose. But but, uh, but it's effective. I this is very much a designed and thought through thing and I guess sometimes I can get a little bit too surgical about it. Uh, this, there's a Claudia, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we can't yeah, really hear just, anyone else. There's just lots of little color uh, notes here and there that bring it alive. Is that better? Uh, you know, and, and yes. the, we talked about the gesture of the horses. Well, the gestures of people are the same thing. You know, it, all, all these things were taken from different source photographs to create this sense of rhythm. And, and I would have judge the silks to make sure that the silks didn't stop action. So this vertical little shape back here keeps kind of propelling things forward. And the way the, the lead horse is going like this, and the jockey is leaning back, it's just kind of a large thing. He's going all around the canvas. And, yeah. and uh, one more confession is uh, you don't have to do everything that the photograph tells you. <laughs> and those of you that know steeplechase know that those jockeys are slightly larger than flat race jockeys. So I shrunk this fellow. He kind of powered over his horse. And uh, that, you know, I didn't want people to, to notice overly a disproportionate look. So uh, he's still large for, for his horse, but you think about little things, just a few percentage points. So on that idea, I think it becomes eminently obvious for those of you who don't know is that Booth Malone is a longtime workshop instructor and is really talented in terms of being able to describe and express artistic techniques. So are there any other thoughts before we head into the history here? I went to his first workshop when he was a newbie. <laughs> he had a wonderful little group to work with. He really enjoyed drinking beer every night. <laughs> when was that? Oh, a long time ago. I went to when was that? In the, the 90s somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never go. 
All right, let's head into the gallery. I'm gonna stop here with the. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this particular periodical, the Chronicle of the Horse. <laughs> um, you'll notice that there is a portrait of Alexander McKay Smith on the cover of the particular one that we chose. And that was uh, to align with the founding of the American Academy of Equine Art. Um, it was something, uh, an idea that really coalesced between um, Joseph Rogers and Mr. McKay Smith. They were uh, members of the West Westmoreland Davis Foundation at Morven Park. And Rogers had the idea um, to start the steeplechase there. And he and McKay Smith saw a great opportunity to have exhibition that weekend that would co coincide with the race and also the um, announcement of the formation of a new organization. Uh, McKay Smith wrote about this in his, uh, in an editorial in the Chronicle in September of 1980. And his original idea for the group, interestingly enough, was not to name it the American Academy of Equine Art, but the National Ac Academy of Equine Art. And he also said National Academy of Sporting Artists in the article, which is kind of entertaining. But the idea was to look at the National Academy of Design and the Royal Academy in London as the model for an organization that would support equine artists in that generation. And really what he saw was a hold because there was a, the Cowboy Association of America and the Western Art Association had started doing sales out West that didn't really fit with the um, tradition of field sport artwork. So that was the, the impetus. And he also named the 10 people that he selected to be the founding members. And we have them, there are names on the um, ribbon here in the gallery, Jean Bowman, June Hara, Henry Kohler, Wallace Knoll, Marilyn Newmark, Eve Prime, Radzewill, Richard Stone Reeves, Sam Savitt, and Else Tuckerman. Um, and we have in this gallery, we have examples of these artists' works that set the stage for the quality of artwork that was being produced at the time. So Booth, if you wanted to step in and we'll talk a little bit about the different artworks and what makes them great and what their history is and the artists as well. So we start here with Sam Savitt. This is in 1966. Um, he was pretty well established by that point. He was uh, he was very well known throughout his career. He had a mm -hmm. strong start. Uh, I was last night at dinner. I was speaking with uh, Sam's uh, son Roger, mm -hmm. who was here, and I believe this is on loan from him. Yep. And uh, the academy was not formed until 14 years after this. And, and in fact, many of the paintings of these founding members predate the academy. Uh, this is uh, perhaps not the height of their careers. But uh, Sam Sabbath was always highly regarded and uh, he wasn't from Middleburg's backyard. Nope. So McKay Smith, you know, saw him over in New York and, and there was quite a colony in New York of enforcement and, and artists. And so that's, a, it was really a nexus between two areas yep. that came together. And on that idea, maybe we should start with um, Jane Bowman. Let's, let's do that. Okay. So um, one of the, um, other important early ideas from um, Mr. McKay Smith was to designate someone who would sort of organize and coalesce this grouping. And he selected Jean Bowman. Uh, in uh, 1980, she'd already had 40 years of a career behind her. She started illustrating for the Chronicle of the Horse in the 1940s and became an incredibly prominent, well-established sporting portraitist over the course of several decades. Um, and she, she and McKay Smith were married for about 15 years, but they had divorced by 1965. And I really think it speaks to how much he uh, 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 respected her as a sporting painter to still see her as someone who should be leading that organization. It's just a kind of a backstory there. This one is atypical for her. Uh, this is on loan from the collection of the Museum of Hounds and Hunting at Morven Park. And uh, a lot of these groups were being formed at the same time. Literally a few years after the Academy, um, the Museum of Hounds and ha Hunting was formally established at Morven Park. Um, and this is, uh, uh, the title of this is called The Scurry. And it's celebrating some of the 18th and 19th century portraits that we're so familiar with, like the John um, Fernley that's in the National Sporting Library Museum's collections. Um, and it's really a, a, the, it, the individual portraits of uh, the um, hunt uh, members at the time. So this was 1989, and this is the Orange County Hounds. And I am sure that some of you know who these folks are. So I welcome you to step up and 
speak your piece if you'd like to point some folks out. Troya? <laughs> no? <laughs> Please. Yep. Just come, come on closer. Morgan Park, and so I was getting to know Jean and whatever, and I've taken a, I've I've taken a, uh, a workshop with her and Sam Sabbath down in North Carolina. But my husband and I went in there, and I looked, I because I have you know, I said, what's going on? <laughs> and she's she was having so much fun painting this with the horses in the old style before photography and. Uh, and I was great to see her and see it in her walk into her studio. So how finished was it when you saw it? It was it was right right along there. It was it was recognizable. I'm so glad to see it finished. Where, where was her, her, her studio when you say it? Close to Foxcroft School. Near Unison. Unison, yeah. Unison. 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 Where and it was when she was married to and I love to see the, <clears throat> the way she had big windows, but she found that the sunlight um, glades um, had a terrible sun coming up through. So she had lines on the lower part of her windows, which you think, you know, when you have a studio, you have to have all these windows, but the glare coming up. I mean, she was just such a scientist. She was so yeah, bouncing, off the bouncing off the ground yeah, outside. outside. Yeah. Distorting things. I was just, I was just. Oh, oh, <laughs> 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 Melvin Poe. I don't. I look. Um, Tria knows a lot of them too, and um, I think Billy Abel Smith. And this he is, is with I, the top hat. Yep. Yeah, and this is um, Mimi. Abelsmith. Mimi Abel Smith is yeah. there. Yeah. And, yeah. And um, this looks like John Warner. It is. Here. Yep. And uh, um, sunlight. Bruce. Bruce yeah, sunlight. Bruce, yep. Yeah. And. Um, Everybody and the people standing even are people. That, so, um, my I have to point out this gentleman over here. That's George Orstrom Jr., who is um, the foundation underrates my um, my uh, part of my position, and he's also one of the um, prime forces and founders of the National Sporting Library, and was a, a lead of the Chronicle of the Horse. So, there's a lot of tied history between these organizations and people. Could that be Eve? Maybe not. No, but. Um, actually, a lot of people th thought it is. There is a key. We're yeah. going to try and get it. Um, on, we'll try and put it online for everybody. Yeah, just if I can ask you to step back a little bit. <laughs> right there. Yeah, he's in the back. He, oh, he's watching that guy. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing that I appreciate uh, in the way that she composed this is you notice that the horses on this side are coming towards you. The horses on the right side are going away. I think the more mundane composition would have been flat going straight across. Mm -hmm. This has great motion in it. Yeah. Just from that little sense of perspective of going around. And uh, you know, it's one of those things that I wouldn't have thought of unless I saw this. And right. that's, that's why the Academy is so important is to just see you see something, then you can start, you can think about it yourself. So Jane was local to Middleburg and the um, American Academy equine art was based out of Middleburg until 1993. And so there were four artists who were working here regionally that totally made sense in terms of picking the top 10. So let's go over to um, Else Tuckerman next. So when the um, organization was uh, started to sort of create bylaws and, and figure out a structure, June Bowman was elected president and Else Tuckerman was elected vice president to start off with. And so uh, Edith Else Elizabeth Tuckerman Bias was her her full um, her full long name, as it were, and 
she's also one who was, you know, she was old guard. She's very well respected as a sporting portraitist by the time that the Academy was founded. And again, this is an earlier work by her. This is 1956, but really looking at the idea that she was being commissioned to do things like the winner of the 1956 Preakness, right? So, I mean, she definitely had a strong following in the equestrian sporting portrait world. Um, do you have any thoughts um, for, about else from you? Uh, not specifically because I didn't I only hear her briefly uh, right. one meeting, but uh, she was uh, what I remember about her is how warm she was and welcoming to new members and new painters, and maybe that's why I stuck around because the two I remember best are Sam Savage and Nels Tuckerman, and how they encouraged me just to do things and participate. And I think that's very key. It's a, it's a, not everybody has that gift of bringing others in, and, uh, and every organization needs it. And I think that's one of the really critical things about the idea of the American Academy of Equine Art. It fosters excellence in artwork, and it also fosters education. And so the idea that someone who's coming up and has the access to these artists who are so willing to share their knowledge and background is a really great um, resource for um, looking at the 40 years of history with the organization. And on that idea, Eve Primefout, who is another local. Uh, else was Eve's um, mentor, really, and teacher. Right. So we're going to head over here to talk a little bit about Eve Primefout. Um, we are incredibly grateful to the Fount family on behalf of the Dunn Foundation and Virginia um, Valentine uh, for underwriting this exhibition. And they really did it to celebrate the memory of Eve Prime and her important role in the establishing of the American Academy of Equine Art. This is a great portrait here, Hidden Capital at Middleburg, 1982. And this was a um, course that was trained by her husband, who was a famed trainer here um, nationally and internationally. Um, and there, there's a really great um, interview with Eve Prime where she, um, uh, sort of a memory uh, interview, and she describes this, uh, really this strong yearning that Bowman and Else Tuckerman and she had to start AAEA with the idea of fostering the same kind of tutelage that they experienced. And in particular, um, um, Eve Prime Fout studied with, um, she first studied art um, in New York City at the um, Artist Club, but then also commuted to Long Island. She had the amazing opportunity to study with Paul Brown and also with Richard Stone Reeves. And that experience is really what um, um, uh, was the starting, uh, sort of that passion for passing knowledge on. So it's um, very much a, a part of that, that origin story. And the fourth person who was in um, Virginia was Wallace Knoll. Um, he had moved, as did Els. So Els Tuckerman moved to Middleburg in the early 1970s. Eve, um, she uh, was at, moved in here when she was about 10 years old. Her mother was from, from uh, the area and they moved back. But uh, Wally Nall also came in the early 70s. Uh, and he really established himself as a sporting artist here before that. He um, obviously, a, 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 and all of these artists were, um, lifelong passionate horse people who either rode or were part of hunts and in most regards and that you know the most authentic sporting artists are the ones who really enjoy and do these sports and understand the anatomy of the animals that they're painting as a as a priority um any uh, thoughts about wallace knoll or Trey? when i was a volunteer at the library um many years ago i went to wallace knoll's letters and stuff like that and um, found you know, a letter from paul brown to Wally Nall encouraging Wally was only about 18 years old. Wow. Yeah, very young, young thing. And, and Wally Nall did an awful lot of stuff out in California. Mm -hmm. Before he, he moved here. From yep. Yep. So he would come east. Too. Great. This is such a nice example because this the, the movement of the handler of the horse is, is yeah. just leads you right in there. Very that is a picture of Kathy's. It is. Yes. Yep. And look at the way these two artists handle the background tools. Mm -hmm. I mean, completely different, but it works. Yep. And that horse, um, every Kathy always said was a thoroughbred horse. He, he won the Breeders' um, Confirmation Class. <laughs> And um, he might have been, you know, a long time, but it, say, he always said if that horse was a thoroughbred, we don't see thoroughbreds that are paints, but he assured, and it was a 
grand champion confirmation course I spent all over the place. Plus, you know, he went over fences. And Cappy was a master at showing a horse on on like that and also over fences. He was one of our greats around here. So it's nice to see And he showed them as very elegant. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 <laughs> Such a showman. Yes. <laughs> The other artists are were based out of New York City. So while we're here, we stop here with Richard Stone Reeves. I mean, you know, I, a lot of these for um, you know, people who follow art, um, sporting um, history and sporting art history. Reeves is one of the ones who documented pretty much every major racehorse that he could get to um, get a commission to do it or to um, paint on spec, but these silks might be um, ones that people recognize here, the British silks for Paul Mellon. So this was Mill Reef, which was um, one of his champion race horses who won the 1971 um, Epson Derby. So a pretty prominent background there. And looking at the idea of like why this one as opposed to another one, I think that the really, uh, you know, Reeves career is really based on the idea that he, the horse people who were um, sporting art enthusiasts like Paul Mellon recognized that heritage and tradition in Richard Stone Reeves' artwork and looked to him as sort of someone who they knew would out of the gate always paint a good portrait with a good confirmation. Um, so that, that's the part that I see in it. What are you, any other thoughts about that? Yes, the thing that really strikes me about that is the, the way the light from the coat gives a sense of modeling that was a really three dimensional. Mm -hmm. This one's also an interesting one because we have an extensive archive of Richard Stone Reeves um, here in the in the library, including a, a just hundreds, I mean, it might even be thousands of photographs, reference photographs and transparencies of the different um, paintings that he did. And in particular, there are photographs of Mill Reef at the National Stud after he was, um, you know, that, on his way to that grand and siring that he did after racing. Um, so this was actually one that was from, apparently was from Richard Stone Reeves Imagination. And it was uh, donated to the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame from Paul Mellon. So uh, it's a great, great history there and a direct connection to the, um, to the origins of the horse. Yes. Could you go into a little more depth about what made Richard Stone Reeves painting so exceptional? Oh, I think I'm going to turn that over to artists to answer. <laughs> well, from my standpoint, it's, it's what uh, Kathy said about the uh, modeling of the horse. Uh, that's not an accident. He was very consistent. Uh, he, had, uh, he stayed within a certain realm of confirmation portraits. Mm -hmm. It's true that he, he didn't. Uh, he wasn't a creative composition like some others, but the figures and the horse, especially. Were dead on, and I think and and, and, and as Claudia said, in a tradition that went back uh, a couple of hundred years of really nailing uh, features on horse, and uh, and not just tagging them on, they he formed that body, and it was a living, breathing horse, yeah. and his uh, his reputation was duly duly recognized. And he's probably of the founding members is probably the most uh, prolific and the most uh, uh, financially successful. I mean, he's, uh, you know, his, his work is are just they're practically traded on Wall Street. <laughs> and the observer who looks at his stuff, you'll notice that each one of the horse holds its head and its body in a certain way that the horse did. Yeah. And that you know, really was able to capture that. I, I think also what makes British and British work stand out so much as the richness of his color. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, he he could paint the highlight on a horse like that. Thank you. Now on this wall, the um another New York uh, founder was June Hara. Uh, she she's probably the least remembered of the founding members. Maybe Radswell would be behind that. Um, Marie Louise Radswell today, but I want to touch a little bit on that. Um, so this is Spectacular Bid 1980. This was very late, a very late work for her. She really made her um, her her significant contributions started um, in the 30s and 40s, and um, she's really a talented sculptor who uh, became a member of the National Society of Sculptures. Um, there's a really unfortunate 
Times article that was written about her, which I think really speaks to the idea of what really the, the hole was and the need was for the American Academy of Equine Art. So it was a Times Magazine article that um, she had gotten a solo exhibition in New York City. And she's being written up in Time Magazine, just as like setting a bar, right? So this article um, basically says, oh, her sculptures, um, they excited dog and horse lovers and uh, some, some art critics. And then this article goes on to slam her for working on commission and for um, um, have basically supporting herself by making sculptures. And she says something along the lines of he, this, um, this reviewer quotes her because she basically, she prefers the company of, um, of sporting society as opposed to art, um, art crowds. And therefore she was, you know, outside of the range of, you know, she's just, uh, she's just, you know, she's just not a high art person. And I think it really looks to the idea in New York City, this, um, the idea of um, having a, a yearning for an understanding of a knowledge of and a desire for accuracy in in compositions in terms of confirmation how the art world is eschewing this idea of you know act this the realist tradition that really is the underpinning of everything that we're looking at today um and you know they, and it, it they also called her the society sculptress which i just really got me but um so looking at that then we have over on the let's do let's do Marie Louise Radziwill as the next one. I know I'm bouncing around, but so Marie Louise Radziwill, she uh, was a child phenom. She's um, ha had her first sculpture sold by the time that she was 13 years old, and uh, she had uh, 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 already modeled probably 15 or 20 compositions by 1980, and was actively pursuing recognition as a sculptor at the time. And uh, this is one uh, a little bit later from 1997. Um, so, and she was the daughter of Elida um, um, uh, Flight, Flight, uh, Flightman, I just heard. No. I'm sorry? No, no uh, Elida, um, no, <laughs> that's not helping. <laughs> uh, Elida Bloodgood, Elida Flightman Bloodgood, sorry, I got the name wrong there. She was a really famous, side saddle rider and um, I also wrote some, um, some books that people might remember. And so she, uh, she, she really kind of fell off the radar after the sort of the first, about the 1990s, um, but definitely was actively involved early on. And then Marilyn Newmark is probably somebody that a lot of you remember, right? Um, and uh, this is Man of War from 1977. So what are what are your memories of her? Marilyn was always a perfectionist. Everything had to be absolutely correct. And I, I really remember her that way. Any other memories of Marilyn Newmark? Did, did you study with her? Or, or? No, I never did, strangely enough. And then I think the last one that's a founding member we haven't talked about yet is Henry Fuller. Who, who is another one that in terms of popularity, posterity, and the size of career is one that is very well remembered as a um, you know, dominating sporting art painting for, for literally six decades. But uh, he and Sam Sabat really were in that generation of, and it's a, a, we do see this in pattern later on as well, but artists who professionally support themselves as illustrators out of the gate and then make a concerted um, effort to move into different avenues for um, formal portraits. And Henry Kohler in particular really made, switched over to easel painting and, and sort of left illustration art behind after a time. And he did do many commissions and portraits, but he really preferred to do works like this that were observations of a particular event and time and action and motion and, and movement. Um, I just, I think there were some really great thoughts you had about the compositions if people would like to jump in and talk about what strikes them about it. Uh, it's, uh, all of it's especially difficult for to capture, uh, mostly because uh, so, uh, 
and understanding the rules of the game uh, are, are key to understanding uh, the sport. So we're found in creating all these different aspects of uh, equestrian sports and activities and everything. If you don't have a grounding in that sport, your painting, no matter how well it's painted, may turn out to be worthless. The people would say, oh, offside, or you know, that's a foul, or something like that. Yeah, that, as strange as that may seem to a uh, writer for Time Magazine, judging <laughs> something about the being a society thing, it's those things that are key to the horse people themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that that writer and many, and many other artists don't understand, is that we are painting a specific sport for specific people, and it's got nothing to do with money or not money or things like that. It's about being correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, as my wife explained to me, I am not a horseman. As my wife explained to me years ago, no one wants to buy a cripple. <laughs> not in real life, but not in a camera. It's hilarious. <laughs> water on the knee. Get it out. <laughs> Uh, the other thing is Cadre Park is an iconic, it's sort of, it is the Mecca of polo in Britain and sort of the, the, the place where modern polo um, developed. And th this is a very iconic view for people who have seen this particular area or this particular venue. And it's an expansive polo ground. And I love this, um, this vanishing point here um, was pointed out to me by somebody who had um, uh, been there in person and how it accentuates sort of the the expansive nature of that polo field and what the depth of creating that fore and middle and background with that with those ideas of converging lines they're really clever yes Marilyn talking about not knowing about the sports you're painting I once did a drawing and Andy yes bought it he said Barbara I hate to tell you this but you've got a number 12 on one of these players and only go up. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> Yeah, they're only four on a team. They're a total. <laughs> Hilarious. I was I was taken by how I mean, you know, it's a, it kind of looks like a downhill Hill. sort mm -hmm. of course. And yep. I, I'm used to just seeing flat mm -hmm. polo courses, fields, whatever they call them. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Over here, um, we have two other sculptures that we'll talk about before we head upstairs. Um, did I say sculptures? Two other works. Uh, the one above here is by Faye Moore. Um, this is a, a later one, circa 1990, but she was the first elected full member by the 10 from the first exhibition in 1981. So that was a pretty big deal. And I also think from a stylistic perspective that she got the recognition of those 10 core members. When you look at the sort of the, the tradition that um, was being inherited at the time that they saw um, something really magnificent about her work speaks a lot to um, sort of how she was able to do this very contemporary um, technique that's so uniquely her. When you see a Faye Moore, you kind of just always know it's a Faye Moore from that moment forward. Um, and how she's able to combine these very avant-garde concepts with what essentially is traditional horse confirmation. You know, a horse person finds beauty in this just as much as the artistic sort of deviation, as it were, from, from the um, sort of old guard's thoughts there. Any other? Oh, she was a lovely person. I love hearing that. And with very eager to help you in any way that she could, you know, she was very uh, free with her knowledge and, and stuff, which is really, really nice because a lot of times that's not what happens. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'm going to turn the conversation over to you to talk about the Gwen Rodin, if that's okay. okay. Not putting you on the spot, but I think that you're a good, a good person to talk about her. <laughs> well, Gwen lives in uh, Georgetown, which, uh, not far from us, and she, right back, Kentucky. Kentucky, I'm sorry, yes. Um, and she is probably uh, best known for a multiple life-size sculpture in Lexington of a race. And every jockey is a portrait of this on a specific horse. And this particular uh, sculpture is a commission 
Uh, uh, timeless fashion. Yes. <laughs> and when when this was being worked on, um, she suggested to uh, the husband to put the smaller bull yes, great. Uh, horse on the side of the neck because um, he was very involved in this. This was a gift for his wife and they're lovely people. Um, but Gwen is um, quite a character and we're hoping actually to have a workshop with her this year. Great. So that would be really fun. And, and she was recently honored with something new, right? Yes, she was given the first Academy Lifetime Achievement Award. So that was, and that was a lovely evening. Um, she was very gracious and very tickled to get it. So. I, I, was, I was pointing out uh, that uh, the Academy has definitely two wings to the mm -hmm. membership. Yep. And a person either qualifies as a sculptor or as a painter. Uh, I think there's only been one person that's qualified in, in both. Uh, and we that are painters are in awe of the sculptors. And I'm told, I hope that the sculptors <laughs> are somewhat in, in awe of us. <laughs> but, but these are, but because we realize that these two things are completely different things, you know, things to juggle. Uh, of ours is a palette and theirs is uh, so much about structure and technique and, and especially uh, 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 the foundry inter interaction with that. I remember uh, speaking of Gwen Reardon. I spoke with her about her life-size composition of Third Red Park. And she says, I worked at the foundry in New Mexico for five years. And there was workers there that thought I was part one of the employees. <laughs> so that's the, that's the sort of involvement that uh, grand sculpture can, can uh, bring on. I think it's also very important from a sculptor's perspective, those who are involved through the entire foundry process, they're better quality and much more representative of the original intent of the artist because so much of the finishing and the patination is in, in, a, in an artisan's hands where, you know, where the direction needs to come from the artist to kind of complete the vision for what the bronze looks like at the end of the day. I think it's essential to work with the foundry at every mm -hmm. stage as possible. Yeah. Because otherwise you can lose so much. Mm -hmm. It really has to be yeah. finished by the, by the artist. The other part of it, which people don't really take into consideration, is how much more expensive of a medium it is. You know, anybody can pick up a pencil and a piece of paper and start drawing something, but to be able to get to the to the level of being able to, um, you know, there's a financial commitment that comes with that artistry that's on spec that people like. It, there's a, it has to be a great amount of respect for that just out of the gate to be able to do it. The price of bronze continually rises. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yep. it's now going to go yep. down. Yeah. And on that idea, I think one of the really amazing things that you had pointed out sort of in the development of the essay is what is it also the critical need that an artist in the United States had in 1980, right? Is it like, I am a, a unique entity trying to be a professional and there are very few art galleries in this country that are specializing in sporting art at that time. Um, and so having the opportunity to create an umbrella that is an exhibition mechanism for, for these artists to be able to have art sales and shows in prominent places where they have access to people who understand what they're looking for, there's that other level there. You know, obviously, you know, we're talking lofty ideals in the museum world with a museum exhibition, but at the end of the day, a living artist has to be able to make a living, right? right? And so I think that like on that idea that sort of the practical aspect of, you know, we're a group and we're going to show together and we're going to, have these great folks be an umbrella for us to start to sort of branch out and, and gain momentum that way. I just think it was a really great opportunity for everyone. I'm sure they- If I the may, time. I'd like to go back to the casting process. Yeah. Because many, many times I've been sitting at a show working on a piece in clay and I've had bronzes beside me and people have come by and said, well, how do you get from here to there? Do you just pour bronze over it? <laughs> <laughs> Why would you know if you hadn't been involved in it? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a multi-stage process. Mm -hmm. it's, it involves heavy industry. Yep. And it's very skilled at every stage of the game, even when the artist's not directly involved. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the reason for the, the high price of bronze. Absolutely. A piece I produce, even a small piece, can cost several hundreds or thousands of dollars just outlay to the foundry. Yep. And it's it's very well justified. Oh, absolutely. That's I, And I think that's critical. We talk a lot about sort of, and also in terms of the tradition that you're working in, and as these artists all did who are that we've looked at, they're in lost wax process. 
And so looking back to the, the if you're, um, a, a lot of you are familiar with the French on the movement, but this particular sculpting process is one of that is reviving a highly um, artistic bronze um, idea and the, the fineness of the quality and the finish of it. You know, when you think of, you know, pot metal sculpture versus what we're looking at now, there's high art and then there's, you know, decoration. And that's the, a big, there's a big line there. So, so sorry, if you go back to the casting process again, I, I'm very fortunate. I live within half a month, half an hour of, of, of a good foundry. But for people like Gwen, who maybe have to travel across two and three states and and even live there while working on a piece, and of course that adds to the expense and the complications a great deal. Yes, and then there are those artists who come up with very innovative ways to get around that. And on that, this is a real sidebar, but it is um, something I'm going to point out. We have an exhibition by Walter Mattia right now, who is a, a really great animal sculptor. We're going to be doing a, um, doing a workshop presentation like this from his studio, where he talks about some of the things that he's innovated to be able to work with a foundry in Oregon for the last 30 years. And it involves looking at uh, replacements for armatures. He uses a foam on the inside to keep the weights down so he can ship. Really cool stuff. So that's a sidebar on sculpting. But um, so uh, we've sort of established the sort of the mechanism and the why of this um, um, esteemed organization 40 years later. Are there any questions or thoughts before we head upstairs to the juried exhibit? Can I something, say something? Happened? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. When um, I think was one of the first um, artists to use acrylic and do clear acrylic sculptures mm -hmm. um, that were fabulous. They were so nice. But it was a much less expensive process than the bronze. So, oh, yeah. you know, it, it helped more people buy her work and it also provided her an opportunity to earn money to do the bronze. Excellent. All right, we have about 10 more minutes for the virtual program. So I'd like to head upstairs so that you can see the juried component from today. Is there anyone who needs to take the elevator? We'll meet upstairs. Okay, great. We'll just head up. Here's the presentation to Gwen. Oh, that's great. Can you take a there's a photo of it's Gwen photo receiving of her photo. receiving her award, lifetime achievement award. And you can see Booth is in the picture too. <laughs> No, it's wood. It's hard wood. Yep. So the second portion of this exhibition um, was a juried component. So we invited uh, signature and juried members of the American Academy of Equine Art to submit um, works for us to jury to create this exhibition that we have on the second floor. Uh, there are, I think you get a really great sweeping view of um, the variety of talent that has been supported um, by this institution uh, in the last decades. And we uh, had a lot of fun doing the jurying. I have to say, Having done a few juried exhibitions, this was a hard one, paring it down. It was, um, there were some really, just really great, great variety and options here, yes. Kathleen Frydenberg next to one of her pieces, Opening Meat. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> she won a, the um, Founders Award for 3D with her other sculpture though. Did you want to talk about it, Kathleen, or? Which one? Let's talk about the farrier. So we got All a couple right. minutes, yep. So we, um, this one was uh, awarded the Founders Award for th 3D, and it's called the farrier. I'm gonna step back here. We will do so many artworks and things in, actually in action, but we don't often get down to the, the real nitty gritty of owning and working with horses. So this is what, what that was all about. And of course, any time that a horse is being shot, we're having hooves trim. If there's a dog in the area, it's always picking up the bits of hoof. So we have this one here, uh, happily chewing on some, some 
shreds and poop. So uh, that's what that's all about. I also, with, with, with sculpture, um, it's always essential to try to get a, a, the piece that's attractive from any angle that you look at. So trying to compose it in three dimensions, so that if you were to walk around it, it still looks interesting. That's another uh, another thing you don't have to worry about so much in the painting. That's really I think that was one of the reasons why um, we all gravitated towards this particular one, because it's a discovery. When you start at from here, sort of every stage of it, when you get to the sort of the narrative of the barrier on the other side, it's really it's a great composition. Shot. We only have so much real estate. <laughs> Look at these tools that are so thin. How in the world do you cast um, that? Those tiny little um, tension pieces. Uh, I, I mean, well, some of the, sometimes, sometimes tiny pieces like that, or bit cheeks, or stirrups, or but a, a jewelry cast separately. Uh -huh. And then sold it on. Uh -huh. It can't be well because it would, it would melt. Uh -huh. But that's one way of doing it. And again, things like brains, which are very, very thin. Yes. Um, what they do is take a piece of bronze welding rod, put it through a welding, uh, sorry, a rolling mill to flatten it, and then solder that on. Oh. So uh, again, that's another reason this gets so expensive. Because all these things have to be hand done by somebody with skill in the back. All right, we have about five minutes for the program left, so I want to make sure everybody gets to see all the awards before we close for the, so we're going to head over to the second Founders Award here. Oh, yeah, we'll do it. I'm sorry, we're going to have to go back and forth, but that's good because we'll get to see all of them. Um, so this is Carrie Nigren's Looking Ahead 2016 Founders Award for Excellence in Classical Equine Painting or Drawing. I'm a sucker for a white background. I think that was one of the <laughs> things that really struck me about it. Uh, this is also the artist's daughter. And I think that sort of that familiarity with the, the biomechanics and motion of the horse that, you know, you really get the sense of the, the energy sort of about to be released in it. Um, and sort of the, that relationship between that um, horse and the rider is so obvious that they're so in tune with each other. There's something so believable about this one that really is very striking to me. Any other thoughts? I know specifically about this, this painting, but I think one thing that's very striking about the show as a whole is a tremendous variety of subject material, mm -hmm. different ways of looking at things. Look at the, the angle of this, that this head scene out here. Yep. Uh, different materials, different subject material, even just sticking with the horse. Mm -hmm. And on that idea, and one of the honorable mentions for the exhibition um, is the Leslie Sword painting of painting in, in, in quotes. Um, this is Batik. And so the idea of this from a technical perspective, the wax resists and creating an actual painting with this medium is mind boggling to me in terms of the artistry that's been presented here in this particular one. And another honorable mention was the uh, Sally Jackson Wild Eyed and Wicked, the sculpture that's in the middle of the room here, gallery here. And the um, Sam Savitt Award for depicting the horse in action, Ankbold Damba Dejara. I think I pronounced that correctly, I hope I did. Uh, he's Mongolian Canadian. Uh, wonderful action. I just thought the, the motion in there was just exquisite and this very painterly approach. The, the background in particular is just a slight hint of the rails and the white spare is a neutral background. I mean, it just really pushes the eye down into the composition. I thought like that was really, really clever. He's, uh, we're very proud of our Canadian members. <laughs> the American Academy of Equine Art includes Canada, obviously, and the United States and, and Mexico, North America. There was a, a time when the Academy accepted uh, a good number of uh, members from overseas. But uh, in the, uh, about 10 years ago, we kind of made a push to let's reestablish our roots as an American academy. And uh, and so Inkbold Damdarja is, uh, he's Mongolian-Canadian, highly trained uh, in Mongolia and Russia. 
uh, at great institutes, uh, has a wonderful hand, and uh, we're, I'm especially <laughs> proud because my goal is where the horse came from. Yep. And so he's uh, he's really back to the roots of, of horses, and, and his palate is so distinctive uh, that we, we all love his work whenever we see it. So wonderful thing. So the last award we have to talk about is the James Bowman Award for Painting, and I think it's a great way to end the program. <laughs> so that's on over here. So when Jane Bowman passed away, um, tragically in an airplane accident in 1994, and then a few years later, Else Tupperman passed away, their legacy was set with the organization as it was in the 1990s as a really thriving and growing institution. And the, the, um, the award for painting was named in her honor for obvious reasons after she passed away. Um, there are, when, you, when we do these kinds of exhibitions from photographs, Sometimes there are things that just don't translate. And this one to me, seeing this one in person was a revelation because all of the, just the subtle intricacies of understanding of the play of light and shadow and the backlighting in this, it's just really just an, a really prime example in my mind. Um, and a great celebration of the tradition of um, fox hunting. And I think also in that idea that founding members really were focused on artwork that really looked at fox hunting and racing and all these core country sports that we know and love today. I, I think Joanne Mill, who's from uh, Oregon, uh, is very representative of the blending of uh, accuracy with aesthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, that is art. And it's not something that's just niche or kitsch. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's fine art uh, to anyone that knows horses. And so, you know, that's what we fight back against, uh, you know, the, sometimes there are colleagues and other, you know, other genres of art. We push back, says, you know, you know, you guys have, have your way with abstract expressionism or impressionism or, or still lifes or whatever, you know, seascapes, whatever you want to paint. But we know what we're doing too. And, uh, and I think we just have to continue to educate people. It's a beautiful form of art. And, uh, and she's a great example of it. Go ahead, Mel. May I have a little time to? Sure. Just as to what uh, Ruth was saying about other areas of art that may be looked down upon, equestrian art. And I think that this is misguided because if you think about it, equestrian art goes back to ancient Egypt, mm -hmm. Rome, Greece, yep. and the English sporting tradition. Why shouldn't we continue it with the horse in today's life? And I've always been one who has rebelled against the, the phrase sporting art because it creates a separate subset or a genre that's isolated. But if you look around you, name, name one consistency in the paintings and sculptures, as you pointed out, the variety of expression that exists within this, what is essentially the representational lane of expression. So in the National Museum, the National Sporting Library Museum is obviously just a no-brainer in terms of an institution to look at where the American Academy of Equine is, uh, Equine Art is at 40 years. And on that idea, the 20th anniversary exhibition traveled to the National Sporting Library, the uh, selection of it. And Betsy Manier, who was the curator at the time, came yesterday to see this. And it was great to sort of have that memory and the idea that it was 20 years ago already that that took place is really sort of a, a, a mind boggling in some ways. But the long share traditions and obviously from a cultural perspective, we support support each other in every regard from the sporting community to the sporting art community and to the broader community of art lovers um, that find beauty in these works. I, I, I don't like to um, sort of draw that idea of if you don't understand a horse, you can't understand this artwork. That's where we come in, as you say, you know, reminding people that before the modern art movement, this was all there was, right, in terms of realistic expression. And so you can understand modern art. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when I remember uh, Stubbs, people said that, you know, he was an equine artist, an Egypt artist. People said, and in himself, he could have been a landscape painter because of his, of his understanding. And we're looking at this, and um, we're looking at all the, the trees and everything. These, these, all these people could have been landscape painters. And then maybe they would have been more recognized by the non-horsey 
art community. I mean, really look at the landscapes in these. That's a very good point because an equine artist not mm -hmm. only has to know anatomy of a horse, they, if they want to put a person in, they have to be able to paint people well. Yes. And if you can't put them in a decent background, yes. you have nothing. Yeah. So to me, an equine painter or sporting artist has to have far more knowledge. It, nobody cares if a tree branch is in the wrong place, but you sure can't put a leg in the wrong place. <laughs> you know? But for the non horse people to criticize these paintings because they do include equine stuff. Right. They're not seeing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I think so. Well, on that idea, thank you everyone for joining us this morning for the Coffee with the Curator program. Hopefully this has enticed those of you who are not here today to find some time to come and see the exhibition while it's open. It's um, on view through March 22nd. And we'll be doing other programming along the way, so please make sure to visit our website, nationalsporting.org, to get information. And you know, also, if you um, aren't on our mailing list, we have an email list. Uh, put your name and your email address in there to get information. We're on Facebook.com and also on Instagram. I don't know why I said that from, but you know. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.